Go now, the Mass is ended. <laughs> now, welcome everybody. Uh, today we look to honor and encourage all men on the other side of the computer screen, the ones that are sitting here, anyone within the sound of my voice, to step up into the calling they've been given. And let's face it, being a man in today's day and age is a little convoluted and not really easy, especially looking to be a man after God's heart in an increasingly godless culture. So the reality is that all of us want to make a difference, don't we? We want our lives to count for something. I mean, who doesn't want to be Batman? Come on. Everybody wants to be Batman. <laughs> who doesn't want to be Superman? <laughs> And if Jacob was here, I know Jacob wants to be Spider-Man, you know, but that's part of the thing. We all want to make a difference with our lives. So, I mean, I, I dreamt of being used by God since I was a little kid. I really did. It was something I really wanted to do and make an impact. Now, looking at the godly men in my life, I mean, my dad, as you know, went into an orphanage at six years old, but he was raised by Franciscan nuns. So he got a whole lot of discipline and not much love. Um, when dad got older... He was really a, a Christmas Easter guy at church, you know. I think he had too much of it. But he had good morals. You could set your clock by him. And he was a good man. You know, he was a good dad the whole bit. But again, I got a lot of discipline, not a lot of love. Um, my, his brother was adopted, and he became a professor at NYU. So you see the change of environment, what happened. But Uncle Sam lived in Manhattan, and he became part of Times Square Church. Now, uh, Times Square Church is pretty intense. Uncle Sammy was an evangelist. Uncle Sammy was intense. He would stand outside the theater district with a microphone and preaching the gospel. Everybody that walked out. But uh, he knew the Lord for sure. He was just cut from a different mold. And I guess that brings me to Charlie Rizzo, those who know him here. Um, legitimate man of God. I admired him. Uh, the Lord put me with him. When Charlie came to the Lord, the Parkers took him in. And we called them Ma and Pa Parker. If it wasn't for them, there'd be no ministry from Charlie Rizzo, seriously. And he said that many times. They cared for him. Um, and then he was mentored by the likes of Dr. Walter Martin, Alan Redpath, Stephen Olford, who were the greats at that time. You know, um, he took over a radio program every Saturday, call in any question about God. I mean, and that's, that's a lot. I mean, you got guys that really want to know something, and then you got guys like, let's stump the pastor. And then to preach on Sunday to do everything we were doing, uh, musical, was a lot. Um, what I really admired about him is he always sought out time alone with God, and he protected that. Because the church, a lot of strong personalities, and there's always something happening, but he always retreated by himself. Mondays, you knew not to bother him, do not call him. That was his day alone with the Lord, because he worked on Sunday at the church. He wasn't, um, he had a lot of imperfections like any of us, and he didn't try to hide it, which again, I admire, because he really made you feel that there's a God that looks after you, you know, family issues and all. So today, as we think about the men of God in our lives, I want to look back to the book of Numbers, because there's biblical qualities there we could find about a man of God. Let's pray first. Lord, thank you for the man, many examples, godly examples that we have in our lives. And thank you for the strength and courage to answer that call, to be godly men, to step up, and to lead in our homes, lead where we work, our churches, our communities, our families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to read from Numbers. I'm going to start in chapter 13. I'm going to jump a little, verse 1 and 2, then 18 and 19 and 26 to 33. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them, so the leaders of the twelve tribes. And see what the land is, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, the cities, how they dwell in the camps or strongholds. Now, you don't think he knew? I, I, this was a test to me. Um, verse 26. And they came to Moses and Aaron, this is after, and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they had these giant grapes and all they brought back. And they told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And look, here's the fruit. Now, but the people who dwell in the cities they're strong, and the cities are fortified, and they're very large. And we saw the descendants of Anak there. 
I'm going to loosely paraphrase a little bit. And, and the Amalekites are there, Ooh, right? And the Hittites and the Jezebites and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea. So all the Ites family were present. Uh, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses. And he said, let's go up at once and occupy it. We we're able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, no way. <laughs> we're not able to go. They're stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it, they're giants, right? And, and we saw the Nephilim. The Nephilim were like mysterious supernatural beings to them. And we're like grasshoppers next to them. That's basically what they said. And, you know, by this time in Jewish history, God used Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And then he led them to the Red Sea. So their backs are to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army's charging down on them. And he opens up the Red Sea. They go through it. And then he closes it on the Egyptian army. So they're saved. Now Moses brings them to Mount Sinai. Why? Get the Ten Commandments. They've been living in Egypt for 400 years. All these false gods and everything. And God had to bring them to school. So the Ten Commandments was a school teacher to teach them what sin was and what holiness is. And it was a foreshadow of what was to come in Jesus Christ. From Mount Sinai, he brings him to the Jordan River. On the other side of the Jordan River is where, that's it. That's the land that he promised them. But before he let them go in, right, he told Moses, have 12 leaders of the 12 tribes go into promised lands as spies. It would be, if you're in the military, recon rangers, if everybody knows what that is. They would go behind enemy lines, do a little bit more than spying, right, and, and check it out. And when they came back, 10 of them said, man, there's giants there, and there's no way we could beat them. We should have stayed. Let's go back. We should have died in Egypt. What did God bring us here to kill us here by the sword? We should have just stayed in Egypt. We had better food. You know, that's basically what they were saying, except two of them, Joshua and Caleb. They shared a whole different story. And they're like, they said, look, trust God. He took us out of there. He didn't bring us here to drop us now. You know, be faithful and he'll deliver the land as he promised us. At that moment in the story, the people have a choice to make. And Joshua and Caleb gave an honest report, but they were faithful. And they could have simply sided with the other guys. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't go there, right? I want to look at what inspired these two guys and what we can learn from them and what makes a difference in a man of God. Numbers 14, verse 24 but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, has followed me fully. I will bring him into, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. So his choices that day went down generational. Verse 24 says he had a different spirit in him. Hmm. Do you ever notice how some people complain about every setback and every difficulty that comes into their life? And others seem to take it in stride and just go on with life. I mean, some of it's temperament, I get it. And then some people work really hard to get ahead. You know, they work hard, they do the work, and others are always looking for a shortcut and a, an easier way to, to do it, right? To success. And they're really, you got to do the work. What makes the difference in that? And I would say it's what's inside that makes the difference. Take two balloons. One's full of water. The other one's full of helium. The one with water is not getting off the ground. The one with helium is going to strain towards heaven, right? So it's what's inside that makes the difference. Now, I think the difference between a man straining towards heaven and the difference with somebody that's just content to be, have this earth as his home is definitely the godly resource, the Holy Spirit that's with him. C.S. Lewis said, aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and he said you get neither. <laughs> a lot to be said there. So in order to be a man of God, you have to have God's spirit in you. That's why Jesus said, Nicodemus, come on, you're a Pharisee. You must be born again. Now get some pushback there because the people made born again, it's made it seem like a militant Christian organization. And that's not the intention. That's not what it's supposed to be. That's why Paul said you must be filled with the spirit. So, so, I mean, as long as you continue to do your best without Christ, without accepting Christ, in my opinion, you'll never be all that you can be, and you'll never achieve what you were meant to achieve. 
I mean, you'll be successful. I get all that. But I think you'll never stand where you could have stood, except the, unless the Holy Spirit, the divine resource of God, is working within you. That's the resource of a godly man. So uh, today, are you full of the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you that. Are you? You know, and something with a man of God kind of, there's something particular about the first and century, second century Christians. A man of God will act differently than other people. I'm not saying you're better than anybody. I'm just saying you're going to act differently. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, has followed me fully. I'll bring him into the land, and his descendants shall possess it. So Caleb was all in. Right? Caleb followed the Lord completely. Being a man of God, you learn to follow him completely. There was no hypocrisy in Caleb. He, wasn't, he was willing to follow the Lord when things weren't safe. Right? And, or just when he was on Sunday, when he was around church people and everybody was kind of like-minded. You know, I mean, he followed the Lord completely, even if it meant going against the testimony of his brothers. I mean, Lord, give us more men that are willing to stand in the gap, right? That are willing to follow you completely, that know right from wrong, willing to stand up and take a stand when it's time. Give us men who will say like Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. But I want to remind you, it's not about, especially in the church, it's not about positions and titles. You know, you know it's, Luke 16 said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. If you're just doing something to get a position or a title, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I've got to remind you that. You know? So a man of God follows the Lord completely, and he also acts differently, and he follows the Lord gladly. Right? There's a joy there. I always said, let God make your name great. Don't play king of the mountain. You know, king of the mountain's tough. It's, you're stepping on people to get ahead, and where are you going? Let God move you along, but do the work. Do the work. Caleb followed the Lord cheerfully, and he was excited about what he was doing. To become a man of God, you need an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> it amazes me the number of people in our churches today that they look like they lost their best friend. You know, I mean, when I... Uh, when I called the guy when I was doing a paper on music trends in the church, I called the guy, I think he was way out in South Dakota, and he was an old-timer. He goes, Chuck, too many pickle puss Christians in the church today. I'm like, what's that? He made me laugh, you know, and then he went on to explain. <laughs> it, it's like, it, it breaks my heart to see people working in the church, and they act like it's an obligation or a chore that they have to do. It shouldn't be that. It really shouldn't be that. Um, I mean, I have felt obligated to serve at times, but a pastor's job is hard. It's, I'm on 24-7, I am. And whenever the phone rings, you have to be ready to hit whatever is on the other side of that phone. You don't know. And usually when the phone goes off at 2 or 3 in the morning, it's not good. It's not for good news. Uh, yesterday, just talking with somebody, I had to be ready because, you know, they hit me with something. I was like, wow, you know, so... Sometimes it just, you get tired, let's face it, or burnout. You can hit burnout. And there's other things going on in your life, and I understand that. Um, but in my core, in my mainspring, I get to do this. I'm excited about doing it. My buddy Joe Brennan, you know, I've known him for a very, very long time. He's the one that kind of led me to where to the seeds of where I am now. And I used to call him the Energizer Bunny. Because you know, if you know him, he's always serving God. That's what his whole life is about. You know, and, and through cancer and through triple bypass and everything that happened to him over the years, you know. But he runs a Christ-centered recovery ministry. And he is truly a man of God. Does he get crazy sometimes? Absolutely. You know, his times are like, Joe, come on, come down to earth. You know, but in his mainspring, he's all about God. Um, you know, if you're just serving out of obligation, please hear me. If that's the way you feel, don't do it. Seriously. God doesn't leave slaves around his throne. He's, in, he's the Lord of love, right? He wants men and women and children to serve him wholeheartedly and gladly. You know, we serve God. You're not serving me or you're not serving the church. You're serving the Lord. Think about it. You know, put that there. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And I could do it without a complainer's labor or a miser's money. Seriously. You know, it's, on the other hand, if you want to be a man of God, learn to serve cheerfully. You know, practice having a heart of gratitude and, and, and be content for all God gave you. 
Like I said, I get to do this. I, I don't, oh man, I got to do that again. I mean, sometimes, usually on Monday, pastors are shot. <laughs> they are. So people usually leave me alone on Monday. And I just, that's my time to recharge back with the Lord. But what I'm saying is being a man of God and a woman, uh, today's Father's Day, ladies, so I'm kind of aiming at the guys today, but you're with this too. You act differently than other people do. There's a different spirit in you. You follow the Lord completely and cheerfully, and, and you follow him constantly, especially when the hard times and the turmoil strikes. Listen to this. Numbers 14, verse 10 and 11. Then all the congregation said, let's stone them with stones. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. Just because they were being faithful, right? They, got, they turned them all. That negativity and that fear went through all of them. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. The tent of meeting was a tabernacle they would set up in the desert while they were wandering to worship God. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs I've done among them, brought them out of Egypt, opened up the Red Sea. I mean, come on. Caleb was different than the crowd. You know, he stood out because he followed the Lord constantly, and he became a man of God, and that's what we should model. From the very first day that he followed God until his death, he was in, to all in. And that's the same. If you've ever been touched by God, I don't think you have a choice. Seriously, Joe doesn't have a choice. I know that, and I don't have a choice. Um, I don't want a choice. I, I do it gladly. You know, but Caleb, 45 years had gone by since he was a recon ranger, Right? And, and he's still following God. And in all those years, he never once joined the complainers, and he never quit asking God what God wanted him to do. What do you want me to do today, Lord? What, what are we doing? He's 85 now, at age 85. He's still, you don't find him sitting in a rocking chair talking about the good old days. Which, you know, makes sense if you did, you know, but he's still working in God's kingdom. And that's how I look at Joey. You know, Joey's the Energizer Bunny, man. He don't, he's never going to stop. Those that know him know what I'm talking about. Men of God act differently because we follow the Lord constantly and we tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So where else is there to go once he touches you like that? Caleb followed him faithfully. And that's part of it. You know, faith is a journey, not the guilt trip. I've told you that before, but you learn to follow faithfully. And when I say that, I mean, you learn to follow God with faith, right? So the other spies return from the promised land. They give the bad reports. They're talking giants, walled cities, and what'd you bring us here for? We should have died in, let us die in Egypt. You shouldn't have brought us out here, right? And Caleb, looking back, remembers, hey, we were slaves there. We were in chains. We were in bondage. Remember the taskmasters? Remember the whips? And he goes, look, God took you out of there. Do you see what he did? Do you really think he took you to this point to drop you now? That's something for all of us. Whatever's going on in your life right now, do you really think God took you to this point to drop you halfway? No way. If he brought you to it, he will bring you through it. You have to trust him. Stay faithful. If you want to be used by God, follow God with faith. Everybody say it's all about faith. <laughs> Oh, George Michael there. Uh, but when difficulties pop up, and they will, when your finances get tight, let's face it, they do. When sickness hits your home, and it does. When, when trouble comes, and when opportunities pop up, we need to speak up and remember how God acted in the past. You know, and provided and protected you in the past, and then remind others, we're not serving some wimpy little lip service God. We're serving a God that's faithful, the almighty God, the miracle-working, devil-stopping, loving God. That's who we serve. Come on. A man of faith acts differently than other people do. And we have divine resources. Ministry. Uh, Warren Wearsby wrote a book called On Serving God. And he gave a definition of ministry. Please let this sink in. Ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Measure what you do by that sentence. Ministry takes place when divine resources, the Holy Spirit, meets human needs through loving channels, not you know, through loving channels to God's glory, to the glory of God. That's an awesome definition. 
back to Numbers. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, followed me fully. So I'm going to bring him into the land. He's going to possess it, and so are his children. And the men who Moses sent out to spy the land that made the congregation grumble, hmm. the men who brought a bad report, they died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Zephaniah, remained alive. <laughs> the man of God sees things and enjoys rewards that other people miss. You know, I mean, the first reward you get is <laughs> your life will be saved. You know, you'll have eternal life. That's, that's the biggest right there. Those who rebelled, the ten who rebelled against God died. That whole generation basically died, except for Joshua and Caleb. And when you give your life to Christ, therefore anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. That's the first verse that caught my attention. Out with the old and in with the new. The mainspring has changed. Now the Holy Spirit is God resides within you. That's pretty wild when you think about it. A couple of verses, Matthew 6.33, that changed my trajectory. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let that sink in. Everything that you're struggling for, everything, seek first the kingdom of God and watch how he builds your life. And one that I needed every day, <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I must pray that about 10 times a day, <laughs> you know, seriously. But God will take you places you never dreamed of. I could not dream of the places that God has brought me to, seriously. And it would bring you among people that, what am I doing hanging out with these guys, you know? And then you think they're so, and then when you get to them, they're just kind of people, you know, I mean... In the beginning, people made fun of Caleb, and they wanted to stone him and Joshua. They had no respect, no honor, these guys. But after time went on, Joshua and Caleb are now held in high honor at the council meetings. And I imagine the younger generation is saying, tell us the story of the miracles again that God did in Egypt. Right? Everything changed. I'm amazed at the company I've been allowed to keep. And, and I'm, I know... <laughs> I know myself, trust me, and that's how Charlie was too. I knew Charlie, you know, and, and, but the company that Charlie was among, it was crazy who God brought him. He, he brought him among a lot of media people. And, I mean, he played Madison Square Garden. He was on the David Susskind show. He's, <laughs> he had a radio show. I mean, and the people that, uh, Paul Westfall, he was among a lot of large people, let's say. Um, through Charlie, I mean, even just the Lord putting me with him, was amazing, because he's probably the only pastor that could have reached me back then. I wasn't going to a straight priest or a straight pastor. I needed somebody <laughs> like Charlie. Um, but from there, and then meeting the guy like Mika Ashkenazi, you know, and being a friend of his. Uh, the guy was, it was like a walking Google. You know, I mean, uh, Special Forces IDF, uh, head archaeologist, he leaded the dig that found the Pontius Pilate stone. Evidence of the New Testament, first time. He was the head of the dig. I found that. Uh, sitting at an air base and having a general come up to me and sit down and have a conversation with me. And I'm like, what am I doing talking to this guy? I mean, it was just, what am I doing here in Samaria on a top secret air base? I mean, last night I met a guy that was part of the Iron Dome. It was his group that developed that. And he knew Mika. I was like, wow. You know, so I'm just seeing the Lord connect the dots. And I used to run away from the cops. Me and Dennis, man, we'd run away from the cops. What, what am I doing as a chaplain of the police department now? <laughs> you know, it's just, I mean, you see how things change? It, it's, and I think during my accident, it's just, uh, it seems like, I don't know, a lot more has changed for the better with connecting. And you see how God takes something bad and brings good out of it. You know, that's all I'm trying to say. Um, the health workers in Morris County. It's just, I've been through a lot of different places that I never dreamed of being. But God just steered the boat, you know. So you'll be remembered too. I mean, Caleb, Caleb was given the most difficult jobs. because Again, he didn't complain, but he would take the jobs nobody wanted to handle. And it was that spirit in him. He was about 40 when he went in to spy the land, and there were three Huge giants in Mount Hebron, warriors. Nobody wanted a piece of them, right? They wouldn't even face them, but Caleb would. God told Joshua, give the land of Hebron to Caleb, 
which meant he'd be driving the giants out. And he's all, these guys had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. I don't know what that means, but I don't want any part of that, right? <laughs> They're big. <laughs> They're nasty. <laughs> but he defeated them. Caleb, and he's, he's older now. He's like 85. He's still a warrior, and now the land is safe for God's children. Give it to Caleb. Wow. He trusted God, and God gave him the victory. That's the point. When you walk with God, you're going to be given difficult tasks. We talked about it this morning. You'll have difficult jobs. Jesus said, in this life, you're going to have trouble. So you know it's coming. <laughs> the difficulties are going to be there. But as you walk through life with faith and trusting God through every trial and season, you will be remembered. You know, and you're never too old to serve. That's important. And I think it's extremely important that children see the examples of elderly people who still live full lives for the Lord. Over the weekend, Dwayne came in with Molly, and, and Dwayne was helping because I got into a, a pickle in the kitchen. And uh, I thought it was so cool that Molly was there because she's seen Dwayne, you know, working and serving, and then she just kind of jumped in with it too. You know, it's, you leave an inheritance for your kids. We all want to leave them a better handoff than we had. But I envy the man who leaves a godly inheritance. You know, I mean, what did Caleb leave his children? He left them the blessing of a nation who knew the Lord. Wow. And just keep praying. Well, Chuck, you know, they're 25 now and they still don't know God. I didn't know them at 25 either. Keep praying. There'll come a time, but you, you're faithful and keep praying and keep modeling God after them. Don't harp on them. Come on, you need to get to church. No, no, no. Don't do it that way. Caleb was a man of God that was worth imitating and modeling our lives after. The Apostle Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So Paul would teach, and then he'd show. Teach and show. Just do what I'm doing, right? <laughs> to wrap it up, God has issued a call for godly men. He has. And he's looking for men who, what an invitation this is. Take up your cross and follow me. I mean, usually you give him the day. You want to go to St. Martin or Aruba? Take up your cross. Let's die. He's not sugarcoating anything, that's for sure. But he's telling you what it is. Take, die to yourself, Take up your cross and follow me. Wow. So he's looking for men that will walk with him constantly, take a stand for what's right, and invest your lives in something that will last for generations. Generations underneath you. He's looking for godly leaders. And not everybody can be a leader, but he's looking for godly leaders to lead others. And he's looking for those who are willing to become godly men and women, ladies. You know, are you that kind of man, are you? Because today's Father's Day. And there's something stirring in you today that maybe you haven't felt in a while or maybe ever. And is today the day you answer the call? I mean, if anything I said resonated with you, just please take some time to think about it and pray about it this week. And, and then this week, consider the life you've been living. And honestly, ask yourself, is this the life that God called me to? Is this the legacy I want to leave behind me? Is it? And if you're struggling, please let us know right? I mean, please ask for help and please ask for prayer or for fellowship. Now, I can't hang out with everybody. I'm not even going to try. But you can get involved in ministries and that's where the fellowship happens, right? Moses didn't send the spies into the promised land alone. He sent them out in pairs. That's why when I see a pair of guys with white shirts and ties, I know where they're coming from, you know? And I'm not sure I want them, I want enemies in the camp, you know what I mean? So, but <laughs> it, it's a, no, never mind, I won't go there. Um, but Jesus didn't send the disciples out alone either. He sent them out in pairs, like I said. We, we are a spiritual house being built together with living stones, people, one on top of another. And none of us can thrive alone. Amen? Happy Father's Day, everybody. Give your, if there's a father here, a lot of our fathers are missing. They're probably at lunch or whatever, but give them a hand, please. Thank you. Thank you. Men everywhere. Let's pray together. Lord, help us get ready by showing us by your spirit that our value isn't based on income. It's not based on our productivity. It's not based on our popularity. It's based on being a member of the people and the family of God. And Lord, I pray for any man that's struggling now. I pray that he will open up his heart to you and ask for that fullness of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that um, we realize 
what we have available to us, that we realize that divine resources, that we're here to meet human needs through loving channels, not to lord it over, not to be disgruntled when we're doing it, but through loving channels to your glory, to the glory of God. What a beautiful sentence that is, Lord. May we take that to heart and understand what ministry really is. And if we need to take a break, <laughs> let us take a break, Lord. You know, step back if you need to take a break. But for the most part, we thank you for what we get to do. And thank you, Lord, for where you've taken us. And I know you'll never drop us because you said you'll never leave or forsake us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Church said, thank you, everyone. <laughs>